Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staten of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, you know, about uh, three or four months ago, we touched on the donkey issue in, uh, in Africa. Now, this was at first it took us by surprise, as I mentioned to you uh, in our last show, where we talked about how donkey skins are becoming increasingly in demand in China, being used for all sorts of uh, medicines, and uh, uh, particularly one medicine in particular called Ejia, which is a one of these kind of cure-all Chinese herbal medicines. But what's happened in the past three or four months is that this story has refused to die down. And let me just kind of bring you up to date, checking right now on the headlines in, uh, it, you know, just taking, I just typed in, you know, Donkey China Africa, and uh, here's what came up on May 15, 2007, on the first page of Google News. Slaughter of Africa's donkeys for China hurts poorest farmers. Chinese smugglers are buying up hundreds of thousands of donkeys. Chinese demand for donkeys could wipe out the species. So that's an indication of just the level of intensity of the international press coverage that has refused to die down. And in part because this is an issue that seems to be hitting a lot of Africa's poorest, most vulnerable farmers. Donkeys are very important in African economies, especially small rural economies. They are these do-all beasts of burden that African farmers use when they don't have access to machinery. In, so in the process with the donkeys disappearing or being smuggled or kidnapped, what you see affected is uh, the entire African rural lifestyle. So you see whole societies being impacted by the sudden peaking demand for donkeys in China. Now, it's very interesting because while this is very much an African issue, and it's not even an African issue conti- contained to one or two countries. We're talking about Niger, Kenya, Tanzania, South Africa, a number of African countries are being impacted by this. But it's also an issue that's impacting people in Colombia, in uh, in Pakistan, and in communities around the world. So we're really talking about a global issue here. And it's hard for us, I know, to get our heads around donkeys, because we've never really saw them as anything other than beasts of burden on farms. But here they are as a raw material now being exported. And just to give a little bit of context, one of the concerns in Africa, and particularly in places like South Africa, in addition to the economic impact on farmers, there is now concern over illegal poaching. And anytime some type of animal or wildlife resource or or natural resource, if you will, in Africa goes into sharp spike demand, Uh, There is always concern about the rise of organized crime that gets involved in all of this. So what we thought we would do today, we're not going to revisit the whole background to the issue because what we'd like to do is check in to find out what is happening now because this is a fast-changing issue. So we thought we would go to probably the best source for that. And it's a group in the United Kingdom called the Donkey Sanctuary. Alex Myers, the head of programs there, and he joins us on the line from Devon. Alex, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, why don't you bring us up to date on where we are right now? This is an issue, as I said at the beginning of the show, that has been simmering for the past six to nine months, at least in the in the press. Uh, obviously, I have a feeling it probably goes extends far beyond that. But tell us what the situation is right now in terms of are countries in Africa starting to get control of this issue, or is this something that is still kind of raging and there's concern that it, uh, it it's, un, it's not under control? It's a very good question. I think it's different answers probably for different places across the continent. The one unifying message is that people are becoming much more aware of this trade. I think even six, nine months ago, governments and communities felt that this was a meat trade. They felt that um, donkeys were being poached and that meat was ending up on the domestic market. But we were seeing increasing numbers of cases where actually the meat was being left on carcasses that had been stolen as donkeys and then slaughtered in the bushes nearby. The skins were the only thing that were being taken from those animals and the meat was left just to rot. As more and more countries are wising up and realizing the significance of this and the scale of it, we have seen pockets where countries are starting to stand up to this trade and just say, no, enough is enough. These donkeys are worth far more alive, both socially, culturally, religious, um, the religious kind of uh, angle on, on donkeys and the importance that they have. Um, as well as economically, the amount of money that could be given to a farmer or a community from a sale of a donkey, even legally, or the theft on the black market. Actually, the, the keeping a donkey alive, the, the economic value that a donkey can contribute to people's lives is significantly more when the donkey's alive. It lasts for 20, 30 years in some cases. So 
I think as countries are, are wising up, that's that's really what we're seeing, this pattern of countries standing up and saying no. So initially it was countries, particularly in West Africa, um, Niger, Senegal, Mali, Burkina Faso, they all stood up fairly quickly and just said, actually, these donkeys are essential to us. They are the means of production for our communities. We cannot strip them out. Of, we cannot allow them to be stripped out at the rate which they're disappearing. So they stopped either slaughter or stopped the export or or ban the transport of donkeys. In East Africa, as countries have been finding out more, they're also doing similar things. So recently, Tanzania has um, has motioned very loudly that the trade is not sustainable there and that all of the slaughterhouses are to close in early July. Um, Ethiopia closed its first slaughterhouse a couple of months ago. And I just heard very recently, just in the last couple of days, that a second slaughterhouse in Asela also now is closed. Um, we haven't got confirmation of that yet. In Kenya, the animal welfare abuses which are happening in one of the slaughterhouses in Naivasha led to a very rapid decision to close that slaughterhouse. Um, there were some horrific images coming out of donkeys uh, knee-deep in mud, just dying because they were receiving no food and no water. Bowls which were just um, falling over, just collapsing and dying in the mud there as well. Just horrendous footage that we were seeing from that slaughterhouse. So animal welfare organisations stood up very quickly and very passionately I managed to work with the authorities to get that one slaughterhouse closed. Um, there is a second slaughterhouse open still in Kenya and um, more as well that have uh, applied for licenses. Elsewhere on the continent, other countries are either refusing licenses for new slaughterhouses, such as Zimbabwe. They've turned down an application on the grounds that there is no supply chain for donkeys, which is absolutely true. Um, other countries like Egypt and Namibia have had applications to export donkeys and skins. They're reviewing that all the time and they're, they're looking at, at the costs of that. So they're exploring quite quite um, rigorously to make sure that this isn't going to leave communities um, destitute and it won't affect the animal welfare, which is really good to see countries stepping up and actually taking that kind of lead. It's also being discussed in regional levels. So um, intergovernmental bodies, regional economic cooperations, cooperative communities such as IGAD in sort of East Africa, the Horn of Africa, they're looking into this trade. Also, ECOWAS uh, in West Africa. I know SARDEC are starting to get very aware of what's going on down in the south as well. So as these regional blocks are understanding this more, there's a lot more conversation about this. There is a risk that we're seeing in some places that actually this is pushing the trade towards potential intensive farming of donkeys. We're very concerned about that from a welfare perspective. But also, I think a lot of countries and a lot of communities are being concerned also about the impact on people. So, for example, if the northwest province in South Africa suddenly had uh, a farm of donkeys with the numbers on them to sustain the kind of trade at the demand that it's at at the moment, you're talking hundreds of thousands, if not into the millions of donkeys that would need to be uh, present on that farm to actually reproduce at a rate to fulfill the trade at the demand that it currently is. Where's the water going to come from for a farm of that scale? Where's the food going to come from for a farm of that scale? Again, neighbouring communities will be the ones paying the price. We know as well from donkeys as a species, we've been working with donkeys on farms for sanctuary, which we've been working with for almost 50 years now. We know what donkeys need and we know how impractical an intensive farm would be for donkeys because of the very sensitive nature that they have. They form lifelong bonds. They uh, the nature of donkeys means that they, they herd together in very small family groups, not big herds, as you'd see with horses. Donkeys don't deal particularly well with very large herds um, due to the stress and the susceptibility of the animals to to stop eating if they're stressed and cause conditions like hyperlipemia, which can kill donkeys very quickly. Sure. Um, it'll also affect reproduction rates. Um, we've seen cases in West Africa, in Nigeria, where donkeys just being transported short distances on trucks actually leads to them aborting fetuses because of the stress. Um, just horrific situations that we're seeing in, in that sort of uh, environment. So you foresee that there, there really is no no practical way of farming donkeys, even if, say, you've extended over kind of a wide swath of, of area or, you know, kind of have massive farms where the donkeys have a relatively relaxed life there's there's really no way no practical way of, of farming them i think from our perspective we always come back to the welfare of the donkeys um what's best for the donkeys technically logistically possibly you could farm on a mass scale but i mean we look to countries like china where the donkey population is dropping at a frightening rate um they've gone from 11 million in the 1990s 
at uh, 6 million in about 2004. And the most recent reports we're hearing is that it's now falling to about 3 million donkeys. That's from 11 million to 3 million is a shocking drop in a couple of decades. And I think one of the major problems is that you cannot sustain the numbers on a farm in a welfare friendly manner um, anything like in the numbers that you need to sustain this kind of trade. If it's not possible in China, I don't really see how it's possible in any other countries in the world. I think, again, we'd come back to welfare all the time. It is possible to have herds of donkeys um, at a certain scale, at very low scale. But again, if, if it's the scale of this trade which, which frightens us a great deal. Um, and also, again, coming back to the water and the food which would be necessary for hundreds of thousands of donkeys and the amount of land that it would take up from communities as well. Which is not necessary, it's actually a product. It's, it's, um, it's not a product which in any way benefits the communities or donkeys. Yeah, can I just play devil's advocate here a little bit? And, and again, don't, I, don't, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but you said that your first priority, of course, is the animals themselves, uh, which is not surprising given that you're an animal sanctuary. But my question is is that a lot of Africans may look at this as an opportunity to, to create a new, a new income stream, a new revenue stream. Uh, you know, it's a livestock like other animals that could possibly be exported, assuming they can get the, the mechanics right. And I think a lot of people might say, well, here's another white group in Europe kind of looking at the animals being more important than the people and then their economic needs. Um, I think there's multiple arguments here. Firstly, the economic needs of people will be better met when donkeys are alive. We know that. We've got the socioeconomic data to show that donkeys are worth significantly more to communities economically alive than they are dead. Um, also, we're in kind of a a privileged position in a sense with a very global overview. We, we work in about 40 countries around the world and that means that we can see very clearly the patterns that are emerging when donkeys are being stripped out from communities. The prices are rising at such a shocking speed that people cannot replace the donkeys which they, they may sell in good faith thinking that they can replace the donkey later on but in reality people aren't able to because the prices are just so high. Also comparing this to something like the ivory trade, any legal trade drives a black market. The costs are such in this particular instance that you could not remove the idea that perpetuating with any kind of legal trade at all will undermine the efforts of people trying to tackle the black market and all the underground trade which is happening. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast that the criminality elements are particularly resounding in this trade, and I would agree completely. We've had a case recently from South Africa where tiger skins were being exported alongside donkey skins. We also know that abalone poachers uh, have been involved in also exporting donkey skins also to the Far East. We have cases in Peru which we're investigating at the moment where we suspect that there's cases with um, other certain herbivores and wildlife being poached from forests, which is also disappearing from Peru together with donkey skins. There's, there's a pattern emerging here that this is related to wildlife crime and wildlife trade as well. Again, tolerating that and legislating for it. Again, looking to China, if it's not sustainable in China, where there's a lot of investment in trying to sustain the population, I don't see how it can benefit people in other parts of the world. Populations are dropping at such a frightening rate. It's simply not sustainable with the um, mechanisms available. One, one of the mysteries for me about this story is why it suddenly exploded so recently, you know, the ivory trade obviously has been a, a has been a problem for a long time in Africa. It died down thanks to international bans, and then it got reignited by sales of legal ivory that then kicked started the market and and you know and and bred a, a black market in in the process. Um, why did we see the donkey skin trade exploding so suddenly? Um, as far as we're aware, we believe it's very linked to what's been happening in China in terms of their own donkey population. As I say, going from 11 million a few decades, just two decades ago, down to an estimate of 3 million. We've heard from a Chinese professor at a university in Beijing recently that, they're ex that they estimate that they're losing about 300,000 donkeys per year from China. It's, it's simply not sustainable, even with the intensive farming practices which happen there. So therefore, people look to where there are donkeys. They look to other communities, other parts of the world, where donkeys are more freely available. Looking at that trend of decrease in population in China, we're very worried that this is happening in other parts of the world who actually rely on donkeys in different ways and who value their donkeys in different ways. 
I think we can't attribute the loss of donkeys in China to singly the skin trade. Obviously, there's rapid mechanization of agriculture in China as well. But we've seen rapid mechanization in other countries as well. It normally leads to donkeys being abandoned as they're replaced with, with tractors. And so there's a welfare issue of barrels emerging or abandonment cases. We're just not seeing that in China. So as far as we know, all of those, the two things are very, very linked. As far as we understand, the, um, the drop in supply in China is just leading to an increase in supply coming from other parts of the world as middlemen or, or opportunists um, are looking for for ways to try and fill the gap. You mentioned the comparison with the ivory trade, and I think that's very interesting because there's a lot of lessons that I think that might be able to be learned from what NGOs like yours, but particularly in the focusing on ivory and rhino horn, such as you know traffic and wild aid, who are very effective at working with the Chinese and the Chinese government and on, and on Chinese social media to help raise awareness that ultimately led to uh, some of the public pressure that may have contributed to Xi Jinping's decision to ban the ivory trade. We don't know exactly why they decided to ban the domestic ivory trade, but we have to think that public pressure, particularly coming from young people, played a part. So I guess I'm curious, are, are you looking at the experience of what happened with ivory to see if there are some lessons that you can apply to the donkey trade? Absolutely. We're working together with partners in China, but also big international organizations, as you mentioned. We need to be understanding really from the consumer perspective, what do people think they're buying? What do people actually believe this product does? Is it is it something where they even know where these donkeys are coming from? We know from our experience across Africa, the manner in which some of these donkeys are slaughtered, in some cases involves a lethal injection, which probably leaves residue as well inside that product which could then be ingested by consumers. There's a whole pattern of things which could lead to actually big concerns on the consumer perspective for their own health, as well as for the, for the welfare of both donkeys and the people that rely on them across the world. Something that really worries us as well that we need to be talking with consumers and the industry in China about is the potential implication for disease risks, not just for donkey diseases. We are seeing outbreaks in places like Naivasha in Kenya at the moment of African horse sickness, which some groups have attributed to the fact that big numbers are kind of pooling together near a slaughterhouse uh, waiting to be slaughtered. There's other risks of things like glanders, anthrax, other potentially infectious diseases, um, which could have implications for African animals, but also for Chinese humans, Chinese population and Chinese uh, animals, wildlife as well. Um, there's a big Chinese horse racing industry, which is blooming at the moment. What implications could there be if African horse sickness or glanders or something particularly unpleasant was being imported on the black market into China? I think that's something which Chinese consumers, the Chinese industry, and also other sectors of the Chinese society also should be very concerned about. So we're absolutely working with groups to understand what consumers are looking at, what, what consumers are doing when they buy the product, but also looking for other opportunities to actually raise awareness of some of the risks of this trade. Kobus, I'd like to get your take on something here because uh, it really seems to me, and by the way, last week we had crows calling in the background. Now I've got dogs in the background. So <laughs> that's just the nature of this show is that we have a lot of wildlife uh, <laughs> in and around the program. So I apologize uh, for everybody hearing dogs barking. But let me get your, your take on this, Kobus, because, you know, when I when this story started to kind of resonate, I just had this sense of like, oh, God, here we go again. I mean, it went from sharks to rhinos to elephants to pangolins uh, to uh, now we talked about lions and lion bones and now donkeys. And I, I just worry that there's this sense of fatigue that is setting in in the minds of the public that just this voracious appetite that Chinese consumers have for uh, African wildlife products may end up in, in creating just apathy that this sense that we can't do anything. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think I think that apathy is happening in South Africa. There is a big movement um, countering the donkey trade, um, thanks to a, a series of documentaries that aired um, on South African TV, which exposed the particularly kind of horrific and violent slaughtering practices. So that could, that led to a flurry of of reaction and a kind of moral panic in South Africa about the trade. Um, but it is contributing to a narrative of China just stripping Africa bare. You know, it is, there is this kind of narrative of like, oh, anything, anything that Africa has, China will at some stage export. And that, of course, is not great for China's image in Africa. And it also reinforces a, a narrative of Africa as 
essentially powerless to to stop this kind of trade. The reaction then from African governments to ban the trade, you know, I, I to a certain extent find encouraging. But at the same time, I mean, African governments were banning ivory trade left and right, and that just encouraged a black market trade. So I don't necessarily think it would be that that effective as, as a ban, simply because African systems are so porous and so susceptible to, to small-scale corruption. So I can't, I'm not super optimistic about where this is going, but there is definitely some some resistance in Africa against the trade as it stands at the moment. Um, Alex, do you foresee the, the governmental bans being effective in Africa? More than anything, I'm very very positive about the fact that bans are being announced. I think it shows for the first time, in some cases at least for the very first time, a recognition of the importance of the value of donkeys to society. Very often they just slip through the net and they're ignored. They're, they're, they don't feature in livestock policy very often. They're Because their role is almost so important, they're considered almost members of the family in some communities rather than as livestock. So often they're not even counted in censuses. If governments are starting to to realise the importance of donkeys, I think that's very, very encouraging. Um, we're working with our network of partners across the continent to ensure that as the bans come in, there isn't uh, a number of donkeys caught up in, a, in an ending supply chain at the slaughterhouses and that no donkeys are suffering there. Also that the black trade is also being managed. So we're doing what we can to understand uh, where black markets are, are persisting and finding ways to use local laws um, and local mechanisms to actually to crack down on that. There's a there's an increasing number of African nations who are, are stepping up for animal welfare in general, which is also really positive and very encouraging. Um, an African platform for animal welfare is about to be launched later this year, run by African Union, the African Union IBAR. Um, also very, very encouraging. So we're seeing a continental shift towards looking at animal welfare. And I think as part of that, the bans have to be encouraging, but there's a lot of work still to be done. That's definitely true. And I do have to say that the, the policy response by African governments and governments that are not known for reacting quickly was remarkable. I mean, Burkina Faso uh, came out very quickly, Niger as well, to try and clamp down on the trade. Tanzania is, uh, I think they've either passed a ban or they're about to pass a ban. And for African governments to move this fast, I think, is an indication of how important uh, this issue is, particularly for rural communities. Uh, Alex, tell me a little bit, just as we wrap up our show, if people want to find out more about what you're doing and if they want to get involved uh, in this issue, either just to learn more or actually to, to take part, uh, what can they do? And, and also, can you tell people where they can find this most excellent report that you guys did, I think about four or five months ago, on the donkey skin trade? Our website is www.thedonkeysanctuary.org.uk. On that website, you'll find our reports. Um, it's in multiple languages. Arabic is there, Mandarin Chinese, um, Swahili, French, Spanish, Italian. If people want to sign up to find out more information and updates as we find out more, um, as you said, it's a rapidly changing story. So we're trying to keep people up to date so they can sign up for more bulletins there. Um, they can also click a button there to support what we're doing, um, to show that they stand with us as we're trying to do what we can to tackle this trade. Kobus, I think it's very easy to condemn the Chinese for their what you call their voracious appetite in stripping Africa bare of its resources. But I think if you're the average Chinese consumer who's picking up some e jiao, you don't really know where the ingredients come from any more than any any consumer who buys a Coca-Cola doesn't know where the ingredients and the water and all the chemicals and all the you know raw materials that came to make that Coca-Cola or the shirt that you're wearing right now, which may or may not have come from substandard labor. You know the supply chains for all of these products are very very complicated, uh, and, and I think the average Chinese consumer is just thinking, well, I'm just buying this and I don't know where anything comes from. So reaching them is going to be very very difficult. This is not like ivory where it was an artistic and it was, you know, wealthy people oftentimes. Uh, this is something different. This is a consumer product. And I think that's a much bigger challenge. I completely agree. And I think, you know, I think a good analogy for this is um, the 
obsession with superfoods in the West. Um, you know, everyone in, in the West, they love products like acai, like like quinoa, um, all of these, these, you know, kind of every few months there's a new kind of supplement or, or food stuff that comes from far away, is exotic, and is, is now celebrated as being the best thing you can eat. We have no idea where these things come from, and we have no idea what the kind of impact of that farming or procurement is on local communities, you know, in, in places like the Amazon. Um, so generally, I think when Western uh, commentators tend to condemn China for its massive voracious appetites they are frequently very very blind to how the same kind of mechanisms are running in the west and in the west frequently also being being then um characterized as being natural or holistic or organic or whatever that you know these kind of meaningless terms that that are essentially just like um decoration put on top of a trade that we know nothing about so i think you know these supply chains remain mysteries to us as consumers. Alex, very quickly, are you optimistic or kind of concerned about the short-term future on this issue? Um, both, I would say. Um, I have great concerns as we're finding out uh, as, as some countries turn off supply chains, such as Tanzania, closing slaughterhouses. It pushes the market in a different direction, be it the black market within Tanzania, or be it to neighbouring Kenya, where there's just an increase in in donkeys travelling across the border. So. It's an ever-changing pattern, and we're we're in, we're really working very hard to understand the ever-changing picture of that, so that we can we can act as as quickly as we can. But at the same time, I'm also very optimistic. I think um, you're absolutely right that consumers don't understand what's going on. I think, in all honesty, if Chinese consumers understood what what this product was and the impact that it's having, I'm sure that a lot of people would be um, pretty horrified. So I think. As we're moving forward, as we're talking more with Chinese authorities, with the industry and with consumers, I am very optimistic that there's a, a better future for donkeys in this. I'd probably say that's, about, that's true for about half the products in your Tesco supermarket as well, I would imagine. I would imagine so. Okay, fair enough. Alex Myers is the head of programs at the Donkey Sanctuary in Devon, England, uh, and they are following the story very closely. And again, uh, we'll post links to the Donkey Sanctuary uh, this is a story that is not going anywhere, and uh, it's it, in fact, it, it's picking up pace in many respects. Just again, do a Google search and you'll see, and it hits at the core of the sustainability of a lot of rural communities who are already struggling uh, in Africa, particularly as commodity prices dip even lower. And when the donkeys are either stolen or sold, uh, it's very difficult for farmers to get back into the market again to buy a new animal at a much, much higher price. So livelihoods and lives are at stake with this issue, even though... It, it again, you know, it's a, it's an animal that we've never really associated with uh, with this kind of uh, of crisis. So uh, that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa. <laughs>